You're listening to Psych with Mike. For more episodes or to connect with the show with comments, ideas, or to be a guest, go to www.psychwithmike.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Psych with Mike or like the Facebook page at Psych with Mike. Now, here's Psych with Mike. Welcome into the Psych with Mike Library. This is Dr. Michael Mahan, and I am here with Mr. Brett Newcomb. Buenos dias. So it is. It's spring. <laughs> yeah, spring has sprung. Right. Yeah. Fall has fell. Yeah. Summer's here, and it's hotter. Hot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have allergies? Um, not on purpose. Mm. I didn't when I was little, but as I've gotten older, uh, it's gotten worse and worse. And now, like literally, I can feel in my sinuses the minute that the dogwoods bloom, and it's horrible. Oh, because you lost your natural immunities that you got from your mother when you were born. Well, because I wasn't breastfed. That's too much information. <laughs> So, uh, you had presented a, uh, an extremely intriguing idea to me. And then I, I did some research or actually combined this with some information that a, a listener had sent. Um, so do you want to set this up? Why don't you set this up? Well, I ran across an article in a uh, psych newsletter that talked about biasing, uh, biases in diagnosis and treatment. Biases based on sex, gender, race, uh, education, income, whatever. And said, are we, are we looking at this carefully enough when we train our clinicians and our clinicians skilled enough to, to uh, identify correctly? So then they did a lot of research and they found uh, significant disparities. An example that they started with was ADD. Mm-hmm. And they said most of the kids that are diagnosed with ADD are boys. Uh, but when, they, when, when clinicians use a uh, questionnaire, uh, a symptom chart to assess blind, then they balance the diagnosis mm-hmm. uh, between boys and girls. And so more girls would be diagnosed that way. Is that what you got out of the article or was it fewer boys? Because this is what I was questioning in the article. It, it, yes, so there's a disparity between the number of males that are diagnosed with ADHD and number of females. But is that because it's overdiagnosed in males or underdiagnosed in females? And I didn't get an it's, answer. It's one of the questions that yeah. they raise. And, and another one is, why does this happen? Does it happen because of cultural perceptions? Mm-hmm. Because we can't stand outside of our culture. We have been indoctrinated culturally with our values and our beliefs and our gut feelings, uh, just like anybody else. Mm -hmm. And so they say, you know, if you can remove the uh, cultural bias of the clinician and just use clinical data, do you get more accurate diagnostic labelings? Right. So the examples that they were using was attention deficit disorder. And then there's a qualifier of hyperactive uh, division of attention Mm -hmm. deficit disorder, which typically comes out to be boys because boys are hyperactive and Mm -hmm. more hyperactive than girls. But that the article is saying in their research, they found that there wasn't that much of a, a discrepancy between boys and girls being diagnosable or diagnosed when it was a blind test based mm-hmm. on symptom presentation questionnaires. So, the, and then they went on to discuss more serious diagnostic labels like antisocial personality, right. hysteria, uh, the, the access to mm-hmm. uh, personality disorders. Mm-hmm. So it made me think about the distinction that we try to make when we train clinicians between personality traits mm-hmm. and personality disorders. And we teach that everybody has personality traits. We all have traits that involve narcissistic foundations, uh, grandiose narcissism. Mm -hmm. But the disorder is classified as a pervasive and persistent interactive presentation with the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just a random or situational or occasional indulgence in some uh, distorted thinking or feeling. So what it made me want to talk about is... When you train clinicians at different levels of licensure and uh, opportunities to interact with the public, Mm -hmm. we have master's level, we have doctor's level, we have psychologists, psychiatrists, we work our way up the food chain. 
I was taught, and in 30 years of teaching at the university, taught all 30 years, that at the master's level, you should really focus on uh, the lower axis disorders mm -hmm. and not your self-diagnosed axis two personality disorders. That that should come from someone with a higher educational mm -hmm. level and credential. Uh, partly because the medical system works that way, and so they're higher up the food chain, their word carries more weight than yours. But partly because if you get in a situation, like if you diagnose somebody as a sociopath, mm -hmm. uh, and the records are there that impact their quality of life, and eventually somebody sues you and mm -hmm. says, hey, you're wrong as hell, I'm not a psychopath, I'm a sociopath, <laughs> you know. Uh, they take you to court mm -hmm. and then the lawyers take you apart saying what was your training in diagnosing this specific thing what specific courses did you have right. in studying suicide and being able to diagnose suicidality and what's your training what books do you read who do you quote what's your reference uh, you don't get tangled up in all that stuff so constrain yourself as a master's level clinician to the kind of diagnoses that are more acceptable and appropriate for you. Mm -hmm. That brings me to another point, which I think is also salient, and that is you must be careful never to forget to see the person mm -hmm. and don't just see the diagnosis. So if I see you as a diagnosis of depression, that's going to distort the way I experience you. If I'm able to see you as a person who has some depression, but is also just a person with other things going on, then I'm more open in my treatment plans and modalities. My questions then become, how, how much is your life uh, troubled mm -hmm. by these circumstances? How dysfunctional is your life? What are the things that we can do to help you be stronger and happier and more successful as you define success? Mm -hmm. So I'm not just looking for a diagnostic label that I can throw a medicine at or I can say, oh, well, you're depressed. That's why. You know, that, that's not the end of the road. Mm -hmm. But if I just see the diagnosis, it's more likely to be the end of the road. So when I listen to you saying all that, yeah. the question that pops into my head is, so why diagnose at all? Well, I avoid it if it's at all possible. Right. The only reason I would give a diagnosis uh, is if the person said the only way I'm going to get insurance coverage to pay for this is if there's a diagnostic label. Right. So then I look for the lowest diagnostic label that's ethically applicable. Mm -hmm. So it has to be ethically qualified. I can see all of these things that are supposed to be there, and I give it to you. But I'm going to give you one that's the least damaging for mm -hmm. your global reputation and lifetime experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had FBI agents come to my office to interrogate me about somebody I saw 15, 17 years ago. What did they say? What did you see? Why did you diagnose them with this? Are they at, at risk? Uh or would they be a risk for us to hire you know, those kind of mm -hmm. things? So it, it could last a lifetime, the impact of the diagnosis. Right, right. So uh, overall, I, I guess then we fall into this, this catch-22. Why diagnose? Well, I, there probably needs to be a diagnostic tree because well, that's... The argument getting... that the professionals make, of which, of which I am one, mm -hmm. is that... If I give you an accurate diagnosis according to the DSM-3, and we've all agreed that we understand what this means, 30928 means this, uh, so that if you as a client go to a different clinician, or if other things happen and other clinicians become involved, medical doctors uh, at, at a hospital, psychiatrists, uh, they will understand what I was seeing and mm -hmm. how I would have been treating it mm -hmm. if they don't have access to me and my records. Mm -hmm. They just have access to you. Mm -hmm. And you show up in a hospital in Houston. You live in St. Louis all these years. You show up in a hospital in Houston, and you're wandering around. You don't know who you are, where you are, what have you. And they find out who you are and from your records, oh, you've been diagnosed with this mm -hmm. uh, intermittent dissociative disorder. So what does that tell us about you? What can we assume just based on that about mm -hmm. you? And how can we then put together an appropriate intervention? And that, that's an appropriate way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And that helps professionally when dealing with professionals. So then 
but but you have to be careful to tell it to a person because they go out right. in the community and say, "Oh, I got this," and people go, "Oh my God, you have that," you know, and they don't know what but, they're doing. And that was going to be my question: yeah. is so then what is the risk of you give somebody a diagnosis and then they start to embody yeah. the diagnosis, which they may not have done if you hadn't it given a self fulfilling prophecy. exactly? Yeah. I mean, Especially what is, if they go on the internet and look it up and say, oh, I'm supposed to behave this way. Well, and I'm supposed to be afraid of this. Before the internet, it was harder to get that information, and so I think there was less risk. Nowadays, the first thing that it is Google it, yeah. any client's going to do is yeah. go home and they're going to Google yeah. what you say to them, and they're either going to decide, yes, this does define me, or no, this doesn't define me. And if they decide it does, then what's to stop them from just you know reading the checklist and in, you know embracing every th- single pathological symptom that they can find it's human nature yeah yeah and and so do you do you think that that is a risk do you yes. think that that yeah i do too yeah. and so i would say to a client even if i give you a diagnosis i don't see you as that diagnosis well we were both educated in the thoughts and writings of Irvin Irvin Yalom. and what Yalom says over and over again is you must see the person. You cannot just see the diagnosis. That's too dangerous to your mental framing of what you're trying to do and what you see. And it's too dangerous to the client. It's too restrictive uh, or permissive to them. Oh, I can act out because I've got this problem and it's not curable. So whenever I feel the need to, right. impulsively, I can act out. And then I can say, oh, well, wait Yeah, it's not my fault. I, I'm borderline. You have to give me a You can't blame me. Pass. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. It's like a get-out-of-jail-free card. Right. So uh, how do you or what do you do to try and encourage the client not to embrace that diagnosis, not to find that information, not to embrace that so symptom tree? you come back to how you frame a session with a client. I believe that what I, my primary responsibility in any individual session is to create the safe holding environment so that I can make it safe for you to share with me and to recognize within yourself anything that needs to be recognized. Mm -hmm. And then you and I can safely speculate about it. I'm not preaching, I'm not directing, I'm not judging, I'm not in control of what you do or how you see the circumstances. I have to hear you. I have to reflect accurately back to you. This is what I'm hearing. Am I hearing it correctly? So you can tell me, no, you're not. Okay, then explain it to me. Tell me more. I want to hear it properly. That's the consistent message that I get through. And then at some point in the session or in the series of sessions, I want to say, well, given that we understand or that I've heard you accurately, my next curiosity is what needs to change so that this isn't happening to you? What needs to change so that your life is better for you? Whatever that is, your relationships, your educational attainment, your self-mastery over eating hungers, acting out, behavior, whatever it might be, what do we need to do? Can we speculate on things that might help? Mm -hmm. So then I can offer suggestions about skills. You know, run around the house, take a shower, do push-ups, read Mm -hmm. a book, uh, uh, depending on what we're talking about. Right. And And I I think that that's the the essential thing is that we may not be able to stop the client from embracing those diagnoses, from looking up the symptom tree and doing all those things. But what we can do is offer them alternative coping strategies, which is what I would do. You you know, you can have anxiety, you can go to the doctor, you can get a prescription for benzodiazepine and you can live off of that for the rest of your life and say, Oh, well I do this because I have anxiety or you can go to the doctor, you can get diagnosed with anxiety and you can learn behavioral coping strategies that will, if if not eliminated, at least minimize it to a manageable level. Or make it more predictable. I see this mm-hmm. coming. I know that I'm going to have this concern. Uh, I have a tendency to stress eat when I know I'm going to be under a lot of stress or when I discover that mm-hmm. I'm under a lot of stress. I have this ravenous hunger that just never seems to be satisfied. And so I eat and eat and eat. And suddenly I put on five or ten pounds 
And I, I look at myself and go, oh my God, how did this happen? You know, I, I live a disciplined life. Well, I don't. Why? Well, because I'm stressing out. Well, what can I do about my stress management skills, mm -hmm. my acknowledgement of the reality, my behavior in response to it? Can I do something else when I get that craving? Can I identify that and say, you know, it's not a craving for food. It's an anxiety. And so I know this, and therefore I can choose to do a different behavior that can help me get relief besides just put something in my mouth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if we come back then to the original question, yeah. which is what is the extent to which there's a bias yeah. in diagnosing? Well, like the article said, it compared antisocial personality to hysterical personality yeah. disorder. And they said men are predominant, like in seventy percent, right? Antisocial. Identified as antisocial, and women are predominantly in the sixty percent, diagnosed as hysterical. Mm -hmm. And then they explain what each of those briefly, what each of those might be. And what was really in, uh, interesting and surprising to me was that they didn't find that discrepancy in borderline personality disorder because I would have expected that. So, and, and that made me think. In 35 years of practice, how many times did I have someone come in as a client who had already been in treatment somewhere else, mm -hmm. in, a, in a hospital or another clinician's office, who had three or four or five diagnostic labels that they had been assigned over time? And they come in and they lay that out for you. And it's like, so what is wrong with me? What do I have? Uh, and each of them... Each of those might have been accurate at the time, mm -hmm. given the circumstances of their life and the, the stressors they were experiencing and the skill sets they had. As they acquired new skills, as their circumstances changed, as their stressors changed, they might then have fallen into a different category. Mm -hmm. So I don't get as preoccupied about the label. Mm -hmm. I really need to see the person and hear mm -hmm. them accurately. And then I need to create a, a safe spot for them so that they can begin to uh, have a place to stand and explore. Right. Where is this coming from? What's driving it? How do I understand it? If I don't like it, what can I do about it? Is there something else that I could do mm -hmm. that will bring me some relief or some improvement? I remember working in the hospital and any time that a female patient was troublesome and the nurses didn't like her, yeah. they would say she's borderline. Oh, yeah. The doctors would never diagnose borderline because it wasn't medicatable. So they would right. diagnose you know, bipolar or right. yeah, something yeah. like that. And, and it was just amazing to me how everybody saw that same patient through a different perceptual lens, lens yeah. and they made their own conclusions and they were convinced Based that they, they were they right needed. and everybody else was wrong. Yeah. Exactly. And nobody was thinking about what's the truth about this person yeah, objectively right right and that's what i think is it, we should be preaching is whether we get rid of diagnostic labeling altogether so even if or you're not, borderline how are you living your life yeah you know can you go to work well are you, you said it earlier kids? what is pathological what is what is challenging about your life yeah figure those things out and address those things right you don't have to worry about the label. Figure out what is the challenges in your life, and can we find ways of being able to approach those things differently that would be healthier and more... And, and to me, it's important especially that master's level licensed clinicians bring that approach to the table. Mm -hmm. I want to hear you accurately. I want to see you accurately. I want to help you figure out how you can behave, think, feel differently so that your life is not contaminated by these things that brought you here mm -hmm. any further. Right. And I'm not as concerned about what, how do we label it? Uh, can I medicate it? Uh, can you medicate it? Uh, I just want to help you be better, experience yourself and your life better. So can we talk about that? Let's go to our break. And when we come back, we'll pick this up. All right. You know, if you've gotten this far into the show, then obviously you find the show to be worthwhile, beneficial, maybe even helpful. And so I just wanted to say, if you've gotten this far into the show and you want to help us out, even if you don't want to help us out, just do it anyway. Go to <laughs> Apple Podcasts and rate us and leave a review. That is super helpful. Subscribe to the show on YouTube and hit the bell icon so that you get 
get notifications when new shows drop. That stuff is really, really helpful for us. And I know that Mr. Brett agrees. Absolutely. Reviews are positive. Uh, positive reviews are more positive than <laughs> negative ones are as well because it helps you uh, decide what, how to focus and how to, how, whatever you're attending to say is being heard. And the secret so, is the algorithm doesn't care whether the review is positive or negative. As our friend Mike Norton says regularly, feedback is a gift. <laughs> if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike. Okay, we're back. And, you know, I, I agree 100% with everything that you're saying about the master's trained individual. I would like for people who are trained at the master's level to really embrace whether you want to call it holistic or mindfulness, whatever catchphrase that you want to use to describe that, to really be able to see the client in a holistic way and to think of them as in, in this way of identifying challenges and then trying to address behaviorally those challenges rather than think about, you know, the, the medicine part of it. But I think that the it's seductive for people who get training and who get a license and want to go out. They oh, want to be, it's a safe place to hide too, you know, but they want to be in the big the boy club. Right. They want to be looked at in the same right. way that the psychologist and the psychiatrist are looked at. And so they then get deluded into or seduced into thinking in that medical model. And I think they then forget their roots or they become causist. I have well, a cause. Yes. You know, because I was damaged by alcoholism in my life, my parents, my family, my aunts and uncles, myself, and I fought my way out of that. Now I'm hyper vigilant for any evidence mm -hmm. that alcohol is a problem. And I want to focus on alcohol, no matter what it is you need to talk about. Right. You know, you and I understand that the presenting problem that a person brings to your office the first time they ever see you is rarely the most significant thing that they're trying to right. deal with. But it's the thing they feel safest or most pricked by mm -hmm. so that they can talk about it or must talk about it until the dance begins, until mm -hmm. the relationship begins. And then they begin to relax and say, well... I am, but there's something else I haven't told you. Mm -hmm. There's something else I want you to know. And then you, you unfold it. So I, I used to teach specific techniques, skills, classes at the university level for people who were going to be clinicians. And one of the things that I always made them do is find a volunteer client somewhere and videotape the first session. They come to your office as strangers. They fill out your paperwork. They present themselves. What do you do? And... Where do you go from there? So that they had to put that all on tape, and then the class would sit, and we would play the tape, and we'd stop after every two or three sentences and say, why don't you say that? How, where, what did you see? What did what you hear? What do you think is going on? And, and I always talk to them about the importance of rolling diagnoses. Mm -hmm. When you go out to the waiting room and open the door, you start to make an assessment. You see someone sitting there. You see how they're clothed. You see if their hair is combed, if it's clean. Mm -hmm. You see if they're interacting with somebody in the, in the waiting room, uh, if they're with a, a wife or a husband or a child, or if they're just sitting there among strangers, are they interacting? Uh, are, are they reading a magazine? I mean, you start to make assumptions about their level of functioning, about their process, the way they stand, the way they walk. Do they mope? Do they drag? Are they trembling? Uh, and so you say, well, I think I'm looking at this. I think mm -hmm. I'm looking at that. But you always have to be willing and prepared to throw that away when you get new information right. that's more uh, intense. Mm -hmm. And so then you listen to the new thing. You say, well, maybe it wasn't that. Maybe, maybe it's this. But the diagnostic model doesn't support that. The no. diagnostic model says, I see you one yeah. time for an evaluation. I give you a diagnosis. Yeah, because the insurance company want to know right exactly. away. Because they have a, a model they're looking at that says, oh, for that particular diagnosis, we give you seven sessions over right. a four-month period. Right. And we'll pay for those. But outside of that, if you're suicidal, you know, it doesn't matter. Because the clinician and, and the clinical work is interchangeable. I remember one time I had a, a junior high uh, boy whose mother brought him to see me who was suicidal. And then the mother changed school districts. She mm. went to teach in a different school district. They had a different insurance company. The insurance company called me and said, you're seeing mm -hmm. this kid, you've diagnosed this, and sure. kids dealing with these issues. Um, we're not going to pay to see you. Yeah. We have our own clinician. We'll send him to so-and-so. Right. And I said, well, it's a junior high boy. We have a relationship. I've been seeing him for a while. These are real issues. I document the suicidal stuff, the contract, you know, whatever. And they're like, 
you know, our condi- our clinicians can handle suicidal mm-hmm. adolescents, so we're comfortable in moving him. So I called the mother and said, they're going to take him away. They're going to make him go somewhere else. You need to be aware mm-hmm. that he's suicidal. Mm-hmm. You need to be aware that this could trigger mm-hmm. an acting out behavior. You need to be aware that you have the choice to pay me independently and ignore what the insurance company is willing to do if you think my relationship with your son is, is sufficient to maintain and help him. But you also have the choice to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm happy to go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. But I have a responsibility to make you aware of these choices that you're making. Right. This isn't something that's happening to you. This isn't something that somebody else is doing to you. These are options that you have. Yeah. And each option comes with a cost right. and a payoff. Right. So now as a parent responsible for this child, you have to decide what's the best way forward for me and my child. Based on you, your life, your income, your your relationship with your child, but also based on what you see in your child. So if you think I can be helpful Mm -hmm. and think that's better and less risky, stay with me. I'll Mm -hmm. see him. But if you want to move him, well, I I wish you well. Right. And I think that that is a really appropriate way to put into context that situation because that actually happens a well, lot. She moved him and he didn't kill himself. Yeah. So maybe right. they were right all along. Well, I don't know, but I mean, I think that, that you are correct in saying each choice has certain consequences and certain benefits. So if you move him, yes, you may get reimbursed from the insurance company, but he's going to lose the relationship that he's developed with me. If he stays, you may have to pay out of pocket, but he may be more stable. So each of those decisions has a cost and a benefit. And I don't think that we do a very good job even in our society, of training just people in general that way. Cost-benefit analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to bring up something that is tangential to this, but was amazing. Uh, Someone, as coincidentally, you had sent this article to me. A listener had sent me some information on a guy named Thomas Zaz, and I had never heard of him before. And partly because it was the early 60s when he was promoting his message, and partly because probably psychology has done a really good job of not promoting yeah, this guy's message. But basically, in the early 1960s, Thomas Zaz was promoting the idea of that, that, that mental illness may be a myth, that, that we may may just be people who are living in an environment that presents certain challenges and we develop certain coping strategies to those challenges and those coping strategies may be completely adaptive given the context of the events that we're living in and obviously he was a psychiatrist he didn't believe that there was no such thing as mental pathology but he was saying that we are over diagnosing mental instability and that when we do that we are taking away the self-determination of the individual. The individual should be able to decide, is this an effective coping strategy? Is this not an effective coping strategy? But if we just pathologize their behavior and give them a diagnosis, then we've taken that right of self-direction away from them. An example of the way that manifests in education, children that are diagnosed by a licensed professional having certain disorders then can get uh, assistance when Mm -hmm. they take tests, when they take national entrance exams for universities or what have you. They can get an extended period of time. They can get a reader. They can get somebody to explain the questions to Mm -hmm. them. There are all kinds of things they can get. And they can be eligible for financial uh, benefits, support, loans for college, based on having that diagnostic Mm -hmm. label. When that began to be possible, Then I had families bring their children in and say, we want our kid to be diagnosed with this because that'll give him or her an edge in terms of test taking so they can make better scores, get into a better college, because that will make them eligible for scholarships and fundings Mm -hmm. that they're not eligible for based on our income and our reality in the world. So if the system skews Mm -hmm. towards giving people diagnostic labels, then his argument stands. Mm -hmm. And that's an example of how it was skewing towards doing that. Right. And it was 
it, it was it was a combination, a confluence of different events that all came together. Uh, but I had a student just last week who had sent me a scathing, scathing email saying, you're not providing the resources for me to be successful. And, you know, as I... Right away, you knew that had to be wrong. Well, I... I, I <laughs> I, I was, I Sorry, was, go yeah, ahead. I, yeah. I, I didn't feel good about the email, but go, go back to scathing. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I sent, I sent this up the food chain because I wanted to make sure that other people who are in positions of authority higher than myself were aware of it because if they wanted to address it differently and they were all like, no, no, you handle it, you handle it. And, you know, basically I kind of pushed back because, you know, I said, please tell me specifically what you're looking for. And essentially what she was saying is someone needs to be, she was taking an online class. Someone needs to be online with me and needs to give me step-by-step -step direction. Tell me which button to push at what time. And if you don't, then you're not providing the resources that I need. And I know this because I am a special education teacher assistant and I know my rights. And I said, I think you're off base with that. I don't think that that is my responsibility. And I have given you multiple resources, which you have now told me, it goes back to the whole idea of the help rejecting complainer, which you have told me don't work. And I don't know where or we go from Or that you don't here. use. Right. Because they're, they're not in the domain that you want to hear. Right. But, but you know, I, I'm just worried that, you know, if we go with this whole, if we look at Thomas Zaz and we say, okay, maybe there is some something to his argument, do we condition people to just be learned helpless by giving them, by saying everybody who just doesn't function at a specific level must have some pathology and we just need to figure out what it is. What if somebody just... So, so the flip side of that argument and it's a conversation for a different day yeah is do we concomitantly make sure that everybody gets an a and nobody right. fails does everybody get to win an oscar does everybody get to be elected president does everybody get to be rich and beautiful mm -hmm. can we ensure that societally right and the answer is no right because i have students all the time who say i did the assignment yeah and i say to them that's a c if you complete the assignment that is given to you, that's entrance into the realm of passing. That's not an A. But they're convinced that if they just submit but as the very educator, minimum of what is assigned, that they should get full credit. As an educator, you have to lay all that out in your syllabus. Yeah. This is what Which earns I do. a C. Yeah. This is what earns a B. This is what earns an A. This is how we measure yeah. how the distinctions are made. So that they have that information. Otherwise, they're blindsided. Right. Well, are they? I mean, yeah. do, you, do, you, do you really believe that a person who... Yeah, because you, know, you, you went to college. Yeah. You know when you come into college, one of the first things you have to figure out in a class, it, it's not like high school. It's not where it lasts for, for uh, 36 weeks and five days a week, and you learn every day in increments and are measured every day in increments. So you have a semester with mm -hmm. a professor that you've never had before. You look at the syllabus, they want a term paper and two tests. So the biggest question you have is, how in the hell does this guy test? Mm -hmm. do you know, does, he, does he look at the footnotes and ask questions about the footnotes? Does he ask open-ended essay questions? Does he act, ask for fact memorization? Because I want to learn mm -hmm. how you measure me so I can compete right. in that rodeo. And, and so then but matters. to me, the biggest difference between today and when I went to college, which Tyrannosaurus Rex wasn't alive, he died three weeks before I started school, but uh, short arms, yeah, is that it would never occur to me that the professor was wrong. I would assume that any <laughs> failure was mine, and now I don't think that's true. I think that yeah. most students assume failure is the professor's fault, not their fault, and I think that most educational institutions support that message. Well, if you're scaffolding appropriately, if you're giving them the resources they need, they should be able to exceed, succeed. Yeah. And the truth is, some people, A, don't want to work hard enough to succeed, and B, maybe they're not able to succeed at an academy. Maybe that's not their skill set. Yeah. But I believe that that is the difference that I see today between what I see from my students and when I was in school. So are they asking from a frame of reference that says, 
I have rights, or are they asking from a frame of reference that says I have responsibilities? They're asking from a frame of reference that says I'm entitled. Yeah, I have rights. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so hopefully that I think that that the little tail end coda there proposes more questions than it answers. But uh, hopefully you found that interesting. And, I did. I did. Good. Good. Uh, the music that appears in Psych with Mike is written and performed by Mr. Benjamin DeClue. As always, we are asking you to go to the YouTube's and find Psych with Mike and subscribe to us there because that is super super helpful for us. And as always, if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike. <laughs>